to put your cell phones on vibrate or gentle stud. <laughs> so my name is Reverend Dr. Nancy Linton and it is my great honor and privilege to be the moderator of the Faith Forum. And we have an absolutely fabulous topic and panel this month. And we offer these faith forums as a service to our community for learning and discussion. And our goal with them is to build bridges of understanding, respect, and support, and to also hear from different faith perspectives. This month, we are focusing on faith and healing, praying for wellness. Does sickness derive from a physical cause, or is it, a, is it a sign of spiritual malaise, or both? So today, we are going to explore that with four wonderful and distinguished panelists from different faith traditions who will share their, their experience, strength, and hope, and knowing in this area. So I know Zudi that you just walked in, but I also know that it's possible you may have to leave early, a little, a little before one. So we're going to ask you if you would speak first on this. And also, before I introduce um, our panelists with their bios, I will actually do that um, before they speak. But just to give you a little introduction of each of our panelists, we have Dr. Judy Zasker from the Muslim tradition. We have, we have Blythe Evans, who is a Christian science practitioner. Beverly George, who is from the Buddhist tradition. And we also have United Methodist, Jennifer Kiernan. Did I say that right? I know, like Kiernan, Kiernan, Kiernan. I only pronounce the N in there so much. <laughs> Dr. Zudi Zasser is going to be our first presenter, and he has such a wonderful background. And you can find out a lot more on the website that is listed on the Arizona Interfaith page. But just to give you a little bit of background, he is an MD and the founder and president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy. AIFD. He is a devout Muslim and founded the AIFD in the wake of 9-11 as an effort to provide an American Muslim voice advocating for the preservation of the founding principles of the United States Constitution, liberty and freedom through the separation of mosque and state. He is leading the fight to shake the hold of the Muslim Brotherhood and their network of American Islamist organizations and mosques seek to exert on organized Islam in America. Zudi served 11 years as a medical officer in the US Navy, and he has a thriving um, medical practice here in Phoenix, specializing in internal medicine and nuclear cardiology. He is uh, regularly briefing members of the House and Senate on congressional and terror caucuses on the threat of political Islam. He's been featured in so many magazines and documentaries and he's written books and he is really, really well spoken and um, has so much to share. Wall Street Journal, Washington Times, New York Post, Dallas Morning News, CNN, CBS, Fox News, uh, MSNBC, and BBC, just to mention a few. And so we are really honored to have Zudi not only as a member of the Arizona Interfaith Movement, but also to speak with us here today. Please help me welcome Dr. Judy. Zudi. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, here we go. Thank you, Betsy. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and um, I 
appreciate uh, this subject more than I can say. I, you know, this uh, really runs at uh, the heart of my day, my day job, which is uh, taking care of patients and, and uh, trying to help the sick. And uh, I'll tell you also, in my, um, uh, one of the things you didn't mention is uh, I've chaired the Ethics Committee at Good Sam now for a little over 10 years, and medical ethics has long been uh, one of my focuses in, in study. As, as a Muslim, I think as we focus on this issue of, you know, what is the role that um, disease plays in our spiritual life? Is it, uh, does disease come from uh, God, or does it come from nature, or is it both? Uh, is it a punishment uh, as a result of, uh, as the question for our forum today is, uh, is it a result of spiritual malaise, or is it both? Um, you know, I think it's easy for both sides of the answer to that question to sort of fall victim to what we call literalism. There's the literalist, uh, secular humanist, if you will, that will believe that science uh, pretty much is black and white, and if it's not explained by science, then uh, we don't have any other answer. And then there's the literalist as far as the theologians, or those that uh, um, are focused on religion and God and, and spirituality in our life, who believe that ultimately disease can always be or often be defeated through prayer, and that ultimately uh, if God wills uh, illness or health, that it will be, and if he doesn't, it will not be. Um, I think ultimately one of the analogies that I always used is that sickness and health, uh, we have the, the ground, if you will, and then the roof or the ceiling. The ground is sort of the science, the foundation upon which we treat patients, and without that ground, you know, that pull, we're pulled down to that ground by gravity, by science that, that founds what we believe in. And the better that science is, the higher will be our foundation and the more we will uh, attain health. Without that grounding in science and, and uh, the facts of medical care and all the studies that we do from the allopathic medicine that has proven, I think, uh, through a rigorous scientific method through double-blinded studies, et cetera, you establish what we call in medicine a standard of care that uh, has proven through studies that if you treat a certain number of patients one way, you will have more patients survive or have a better quality of life than if you treat them another way. That sort of allopathic approach to medicine uh, has stood the rigor of time and actually is held accountable not only from medicine but from the legal profession and others who uh, hold us, who hold our feet to the fire through medical legal mechanisms to make sure that we address that standard of care. Aside from allopathic medicine, then you have homeopathic and other types of medicine that really don't necessarily follow a standard of care per se, but clearly a lot of times do have benefits. I think a lot of the allopathic treatment that we use today comes from homeopathic uh, histories, uh, but again, they're not necessarily held to the same standards. Uh, you can be promised the world through vitamins and other things, and as we know, Arizona is one of the centers, uh, Andrew Weil. There's an old debate that Andrew Weil and others have had with the folks at the New England Journal of Medicine as to which is better. And I think one of the messages I want you to leave with here today is to understand that both are necessary, that obviously uh, non-traditional medicine, spirituality, prayer, all these things I think impact our health and our well-being. However, we have to be careful for the concept which I think is a false hope. Not false as in black and white, false hope, but the concept that if we rely too much and don't look upon, um, and one of the terms I like to use is supplemental medicine rather than alternative. When you say alternative, it implies that one or the other, uh, but rather you add to the therapy of patients and to ourselves through non-traditional means, through prayer and well-being. And, and ultimately, I would tell you that the ceiling is thus that which is unknown. And that this conflict, and in a lot of my reform work that we've been doing, is there's this conflict in the literalists of our faiths, whether it's Islam or any faith, and my faith tradition is, is Muslim, that those who believe that as it is written in scripture it will be, and as they interpret it it will be, and then obviously it's a black and white phenomenon. And I can tell you that one of the challenges in, in running up against sometimes some of the chaplains or imams who may come into hospitals to offer advice is that they, be, they will often entertain their advice as being reliant upon their pure and simple expertise in theology, when in fact often the expertise we need is related to the specialties that we're dealing with, such as with medicine 
and uh, what the standards are. And yet these two worlds sometimes come into collision. This is not to say that, um, you know, so the question is, is, does disease come from a spiritual malaise? Do those people who are further from God then manifest more disease than not? My simple answer is, I don't believe so. I think that if the answer to that was true, then what you're doing is you're abrogating free will. Because in a, in a world uh, where disease that God punishes us on this earth, and disease befalls those who are not spiritually active, uh, I think then you're saying that God interferes in this world. He may interfere through prayer, uh, but again, I'm not sure if that's interference or actual, and this has not been proven. There have been studies actually that have studied the impact of prayer upon health. Now, do I believe those are double-blinded studies? I don't. I think that it's impossible to double-blind those studies because you have a variable which I think hasn't been studied, and that variable is when individuals pray, do they in some ways increase their own body chemistry in a way and change it in a way through their positive sense of prayer that thus brings them towards health? And uh, I don't believe there's been studies to show that atheists, for example, have less disease or more disease than non-atheists. And I do believe that uh, um, uh, while that study maybe should be done, I think one of the most remarkable studies shows that patients that have been prayed for by anonymous people do actually, there has been a study show that when you did internet type prayer, you say there's a patient who's ill, please pray for him. They were able to show that those patients did better. Now again, as a, my needle sort of leans more towards the science part of things, I'm still skeptical of that, but it's hard to deny that there is some evidence and, and what that comes from, I don't know, maybe the patient knew they were praying for, maybe they didn't. At the end of the day, I think these things still need to be studied, but as a believer in God and as a Muslim, I do believe that prayer is important um, and, and does play a role in our well-being. However, you can't <laughs> deny that that science has to be founded in doing the best we can. And there's a number of, of sayings from the Prophet Muhammad that discuss that, yes, Take care of, yes, be close to God and, and pray, however, always, you know, uh, um, do what you can that is in your power and that you'll be held accountable for that. So, always life is, is full of challenges and I think we're always tested. Uh, there's, uh, I can't remember the name of the rabbi who wrote an excellent book called uh, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Uh, yeah, Rabbi Kushner. And, you know, there's a lot written out there that just, uh, I think, the, the primary answer to that is um, that's one of the, the beauties of free will is that we know that we live in a world that we have free will or we have freedom to pick and choose uh, belief or not belief because at the end of the day the word faith only has meaning if you have faith. If he comes out and reveals himself or we have a study that proves faith to be a real benefit, I don't think it's faith anymore. I think it becomes something that you can prove and you have to believe because it has revealed itself to you. So faith would then, you know, but this is where the world of science and the world of faith will always conflict. I do want to end with one concept in Islam, and which I think um, I would love to hear from the other panelists about your faiths. But it's interesting. The one thing that all Muslims agree on is the fact that the Arabic script of the Quran is the word of God. To the common, and that this is the exact word that was revealed. Now, what we don't agree on is the interpretations of these passages and their context in today's world, etc. And there's the disagreement between the metaphysical and the and the literal, etc. But there's also multiple references in Islam that just as the, the word of God in our scripture and in the Old Testament, etc., is the direct word of God, DNA, science understanding nature is like reading the Quran because these are creations of God. So ultimately, this is one of the reasons, if you ask me why I went into medicine, to me one of the, the closest ways to get close to God is not only taking care of patients but actually studying human science and, and uh, studying his creations and life on earth because these are creations of God. And to a Muslim there's a hadith that says that, that to study science is, is to study God's word because you are studying his creation. So as a result, I would tell you that the two are not in conflict, that one reveals the other, that ultimately many things today that we may take for faith, we may prove 
that the cognitive methods that we do to pray may ultimately release uh, uh, um, anti-cancer hormones, other things um, that make us better. I will tell you the other proof I have almost every week that the spirit plays a significant role is when I talk to patients about code status and end of life issues. And that no matter how long their struggle has been with cancer, they may be in stage four, etc. And then when we finally talk to them about code status and they decide that they don't want everything done at the end of their life and that they think that that would be prolonging death rather than allowing natural death. I can't tell you how things start to change in that patient. Often you start to see their lab deteriorate, you start to see uh, um, almost uh, a, a change in who they are. And there has to be something spiritual behind that. Uh, that can't be explained by medicine. It can't be, it, it, it's basically the soul beginning to accept the fact that death is coming. And uh, do all patients respond that way? No. Uh, they vary, but I do believe that that's evidence to those who are open to it uh, that uh, the spirituality does play a role in our well-being. So, um, um, to that, I look forward to the questions and answers. Thank you. 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 But a lot of um, faith, and what I loved was faith and science are not in conflict, and the experiences that you've had in that, and also faith, the, the idea of the word faith to have meaning, um, you have to have that belief of faith. So there was so much that you shared that was so rich. Next, we're going to turn to Blythe Evans, who is a Christian science practitioner, and Christian science acknowledges that the healing work done by our loving master, Jesus Christ Jesus and his apostles, is still available today. As, to, as a Christian science practitioner, Blythe is in the full-time healing ministry and meets with those requesting help to share how this healing can be done and to provide powerful and prayerful treatment for ills of any kind. For example, physical, financial, mental, emotional, relationship issues, etc. And you can learn more about that if you go to our website and click on the links under the events today. So please help me welcome Blythe Evans. Thank you, Mitzi, for such an enthusiastic introduction. I really appreciate it. And um, it's always a joy to discuss um, faith and healing and how our love and understanding of God assures us of health and well-being. So I thought I'd start by just defining Christian science a little bit for you and then give you an example of how we would pray about something in Christian science. So first, just to clear up any misconception there might be, Christian science is not the same as Scientology. They're two just completely different entities. Um, Christian science is a Christian religion based on the life and works of Christ Jesus. We believe in the virgin birth, that um, Christ Jesus was the Son of God. We acknowledge Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and we read and study the Bible, both the Old and New Testaments. So that's the Christian part of Christian science. The science part comes from, well, what is a science? A science is a body of knowledge that has laws and principles that's subject to proof by anyone who follows the rules of that science. A science is based on a principle that's dependable and unchangeable. We can look at the science of mathematics, for example. 3 plus 4 equals 7 was always the same. It will always be the same. It's based on the principle of mathematics. Well, Christianity and Christian healing is based on principle. And that principle is divine love. And divine love is God, who has only good for his 
his children always. And when we understand this principle of eternal harmony, God, divine love, we can apply it to difficult situations such as sickness, emotional problems, financial challenges, relationship situations, etc. And we can find healing of these just as Christ Jesus did and his apostles after him. So just to give you a little example of how you go about about this, I uh, had something come up in my own experience just recently. I uh, started to uh, have rather aggressive flu symptoms a couple of weeks ago. And so I began to pray and give myself a Christian Science prayerful treatment. Now, in the Bible, in uh, Matthew 17, 21, Jesus is healing the man's son who the disciples were unable to heal. And Jesus said, when the disciples asked him, why couldn't we heal this? He said, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So we can think about prayer and fasting as the prayer part is the affirming of all those wonderful truths about God in the Bible. And the fasting part is when we refute and refuse to take in the lies about God and man. So when I'm speaking about my prayer, you'll hear me talking about affirming and sometimes denying. Well, I started my prayer by affirming what the Bible teaches us in Genesis chapter 1, that God is the only creator, that man is God's image and likeness, and that all that God created is good. And that was the end. I affirmed that God is divine love, as Christ Jesus taught. Therefore, I didn't need to fear that anything bad could come upon me, because only God, good, exists and is manifest in my life. I affirmed that God is spirit. Jesus calls God spirit in John 4, 24. And if God is spirit, not matter, then I, as God's image and likeness, must be spiritual too. My true being must be a spiritual being, not material. So I couldn't be susceptible to material diseases. Then I denied that material symptoms could make me doubt the all power of, and presence of infinite love, the reality of divine spirit, or the fact that God, good, is supreme. I affirmed I didn't have to be afraid this condition could get worse or linger because I knew God, divine spirit, divine love, is all there is, and therefore I, as the creation of God, could experience and express good, as God's creation is defined in 1 Genesis. I refuted all the common theories about the reality and inevitability of the flu. And you know, we're so bombarded with that. If you, if you walk into Walgreens to, to uh, buy a ballpoint pen, it will be telling you over the loudspeaker that it's flu season and you should expect the flu and you're going to have these symptoms and it's, it's good to be alert to the messages that are, that are coming to us. I continue to affirm it that what God knows about me is true and all good. Then I prayerfully contemplated these ideas. I pondered them. I realized them. I prayed them. And I reached out in prayer, listening to God for other ideas like these, other healing ideas. Finally, I restated to myself the truth that God is all, that He is good, and that I, as His loved child, can experience only the good, health, 
and well-being that he has created. I rejoiced and gave thanks to God for this understanding, confident it would bring healing. Well, the symptoms in all of this started on a Sunday. On Monday, I rested and continued my prayerful treatment. On Tuesday, I was back to normal and back to work. And I was so grateful for another proof of God's continual care. Now, I suppose you could listen to this and say, well, that would have happened anyway, or, eh, you probably didn't have a flu. And, but there are many, many hundreds and thousands of cases healed through Christian science of medically diagnosed cancer, diabetes, uh, Alzheimer's, all sorts of things which have been healed through the power and presence of knowing that God is the divine principle of all existence. And before I finish, I just wanted to let you know I, I brought some things to share if anybody's interested in pursuing any of this on your own later. Mary Baker Eddy, who is the discoverer and founder of Christian Science, wrote a wonderful book which explains the Bible in its spiritual import and also explains uh, Christian science in depth called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. And this book is absolutely not a substitute for the Bible for us. Uh, we study the Bible and science and health every day. But the first chapter is uh, 16 short pages on prayer, which is very interesting and easy to read. There's also a lengthy chapter on how to practice Christian science healing. And the last chapter called Fruitage is a hundred pages of testimonials of people who've been healed only through reading this book and, and applying the ideas about God that are therein. So I brought some copies if anybody would like to take one afterwards and help yourself. Our church also puts out monthly and weekly magazines and um, each magazine always has testimonials again of people healed through their prayer and application of Christian science. So help yourself to any of those if you'd like. Um, as you mentioned, ChristianScience.com is a great website. It has all sorts of things. Uh, Christian Science Reading Rooms. Most churches maintain a reading room, which is a store where you can purchase materials on Christian Science or just sit and read and pray. And of course, there's also Christian Science Practitioners who are in the full-time healing practice who are always happy to meet with you and just answer questions or explore ideas. And so I have I brought some of my business cards. If anybody wants to give me a call or send me an email, I'd always just be happy to hear from you. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Blythe, so much for giving us a brief understand, very, very brief, <laughs> synopsis of what Christian scientists believe in, and also giving us the example of the prayer that you treated for yourself. So next, we turn to beloved Arizona Interfaith Board member, Zudi, you're beloved too. You're all beloved. Everyone in the room is beloved. So I don't want anyone to feel left out. It's not a eulogy. Yeah, no eulogy. <laughs> so, Professor Beverly George is a Buddhist holistic health practitioner with master's degrees in health sciences and education. She's a licensed massage therapist, I did not know that, with, who specializes in Asian bodywork, Reiki, and traditional Chinese medicine. She is a master teacher in the Reiki method of healing and a certified hypnotherapist. Ms. George is a practicing SGI Buddhist. Please help me welcome Beverly. Because we have so many similarities. 
So, um, hold it right up. All right, thank you. I am a called an SGI Buddhist, and that means there are many different sects of Buddhism. But this particular sect of Buddhism was started in Japan and it was founded by a 13th century monk by the name of Mishun Dashoni. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the traditional historical Buddha pictures that everybody's familiar with, the Buddha we call Watama Siddhartha. Now, the Buddha, you know, the history about him, he left home and he traveled and taught. He wrote, he expounded over 80,000 sutras, which means teachings and writings. Our particular set, we follow the very last sutra that he taught, which is called the Lotus Sutra. The Buddha, as he ventured throughout India, taught his disciples that his basic tenet was to discover what was the cause of suffering. So the question is, is suffering caused by physical pain or mental issues? Which is it? And what he did is that when he became enlightened, he began to talk about liberation from sickness and death. He didn't say that you would never die. He said liberation from what it means in your life. It is a doctrine without discrimination of caste, race, or wealth, respect to equality between human beings and animals, and professes to solve everyday life difficulties. When the Buddha talked about the different, he talked about four different things, birth, sickness, old age, and death. And what he was talking about is the act of becoming detached. And the detachment goes to the concept of whether or not illness starts in the brain or in the body. And so he said suffering results from mental ignorance, which provokes the arising of physical and mental disorders. So I think that he focused on the inner self, the mental, the mind-body connection, which has been proven with a lot of studies, and Dr. Marks can talk about that, in terms of does the mind affect the body and vice versa. So in the Buddhist practice, there's a lot of discussion in terms of how do we determine that? What are the concepts? What are the things? And what I want to say to you is, there's one concept, and then I'll go back to the whole thing about praying for wellness, and I want to discuss the concept of the oneness and body, of body and mind. It's a core Buddhist concept. Dr. Norman Cousins was a collaborator with Dr. Uh, president Ikeda, who's the president of our, our organization, in terms of trying to determine, if, does this really happen? So Dr. Cousins was very ill. And he decided to embark on a quest to see whether or not laughter could have an effect on his illness. So he started watching films and jokes and funny things and on and on and on and on. He was, I think, in his 50s when he got really ill. And he said he wrote a lot of books about it and had a discussion with President K about this issue. And one of the things he said was that what laughter does when he talked to some of the other doctors, it changed the, it changed the, the whole um, map of his brain to affect the body. Studies at the Mind Body Institute around the country have been doing studies on this to see how the mind affects the body and what exactly is happening in terms of how the body responds. So he said the laughter the changes it made to the body indicates physical phenomena and literally that which can be seen, which in this term is considered mind, means spiritual and mental phenomena which are invisible. So there's that part that we're not quite sure about that we can't prove. But in the Buddhist tradition of looking at this, the Buddha said oneness does not mean that body and mind are absolutely identical as Dr. Akeda and Mr. Cousin and other uh, their members have discussed. It is a translation of a Chinese term meaning two but not two or non-duality. This means that while body and mind, physical and spiritual, 
are clearly two distinct classes of phenomena. There are aspects of the same thing. This comes from the teachings way back, and I'll talk about that in a minute, in terms of the teachings, in terms of Chinese medicine, how the Chinese looked at the body, how they healed it, the kinds of things they did in order to bring around uh, stabilization of the phenomena of the mind and body. They are both rooted in the common source of life itself, in the ultimate reality of law of life. Now, in, when he talks about Nishun Daishonin, in the record of the orally transmitted teachings, Nishun Daishonin states that the word Nami Hore Mekyo, which is the phrase that our Buddhist sects chants every day, that's part of our Buddhist practice, our prayers, which translates to devotion to the law, the mystic law of cause and effect through sound. Sound because although in many Buddhist practices, in Sandy, for instance, they meditate quietly, in this practice, we believe that sound affects vibration, affects the universe, affects energy, and then comes back to us in that form. And so when we're chanting, we feel that we're really activating that life force in the universe, which then proceeds to help us with our prayer achieve our ultimate goal. So he says the word nam myoho which derives from the Sanskrit language, is translated into Chinese as two characters, one meaning devotion and the other life. Devotion in the case of physical aspect or body, and life, the spiritual aspect of mind. This suggests that the highest principle of Buddhism is the ability that we can manifest in our beings, in our bodies and minds, the fundamental enlightenment inherent to all life, which is what the Buddha achieved and was trying to promulgate when he was preaching, the concept of enlightenment. This fundamental enlightenment is also called the Buddha nature, which we in our Buddhist practice talk about all the time. And what we say is, just to the side, there was a disciple of the Buddha who was so appreciative of every single person he met that every time he met them, he would bow to them. And he said, I bow to your Buddha nature because every single human being has a Buddha nature. Whether you can see it or not, it is there. And so when we devote ourselves to this law, we call Buddha nature the mystic law of manhood through Buddhist practice, we tap into the source of cosmic life force from which the physical and spiritual aspects of life arise. In this way, we enrich, harmonize, and revitalize our spiritual and spiritual selves, our bodies, and our minds. When we seriously pray for and feel concern for others, which is mind, our words, others, our minds, and actions, our body, because we need our body to pray, you know, it's active, a physical act. But our mind is focused on those people. Actions but toward them, we can lift, uplift their spirits, which is their mind, which can in turn lead to a positive change in their physical health, and also their own words and actions, which is their body. So, we can chant for them. And one of the tenets in our practices, very common, we don't have any special things. Every single person in our practice who chants Nami Hore Nikyo and practices is considered a healer because we believe that every single one of us has the ability to affect someone else's health, to help them with their illness by praying or chanting for them. So every single person, somebody gets sick, Emails go out, letters, people call each other. I'm talking all over the country. A certain person is, please chant for them. And so you just you put it on your altar. We have altars and mountains. And you chant for that person. It doesn't matter whether you know them or not, or it doesn't matter. Because we really believe that we have the ability to have an effect on that person. Or people, places. So, um, it says, when we seriously play, pray for, feel concerned for others, mind our words and action toward them, 
uplift your spirits, physical health. It says, at the same time, applying our voice and actions in this way enhances and develops our own spiritual state. So it's not just, we're not just doing it for them. And, and I find this in many other religions, and that's why sometimes I say we, we're all coming from the same place, because we truly believe when we are praying for someone with this law, that we, that's our tool, we are not only elevating your life, but we are absolutely elevating our own, because remember, it is the law, mystic law of cause and effect. So if I am praying, chanting for you, I am creating the highest level of effect for your life to heal you. But it also is reciprocal, because in terms of universal law, then I get the benefit just as well. So it's not, it's not just a one directional prayer. It is completely in, encompassing what human life is. And that's because one of the things that the Buddha talked about in his teaching was dependent origination. And the dependent origination appears when you apply the law. And that is that every single person in this room and everything in the universe is connected. So if I'm chanting for you, then I'm chanting for the world. If I'm chanting for you, then I'm chanting for everybody else. And once we get that concept, the concept of faith is really difficult. I agree. I agree with what Dr. Morris was saying. So what is faith? You know, we talk about just have faith. But with our practice, what we do is a little bit different. We say to somebody, if you're interested in this practice, you don't have to have faith. All we want you to do is just try this check and see what happens. And sometimes, because faith is a very good, I, I, I love what you both said, faith is a very difficult thing to define. What is faith? Some people instantly, I really believe, other people are like, ah, I don't know. Or some people show outward appearance, so I'm going to pray, but inside, and we always talk about, because we chant to as well, we always talk about when you're sick, that that's the uh, really ecological work, but it's the stimulus that helps us. When we talk about that, that's if you sit in front of anything, don't you? If it be a God, Buddha, that, that stimulus, that object, knows your heart. So even if you're chanting or you're praying and it's out there, but if it's, if it's not connected, then you can, what is faith? Faith is really believing that you have that connection. So we tell the people, sometimes, sometimes people have to try something and see what happens. Or they, I like what you said, it has to appear. So we believe that if somebody really needs help, that we can offer this to them, and we don't expect them to pick up the matter and run with it. What we expect is to just try and see what happens, because it's an activation of your life force. And once the life force is activated, and then people try, and, oh, let me, oh, I'm gonna, well, I, I, I need to heal this, or I need to. My relationship, because you know healing with relationships and illness sometimes are together, you know. So sometimes you have to, to, uh, to uh, tend to what in order to find out what's, what about a person sick. So one of the things that they do then is they decide, well, this really works for me. That faith develops. So it does three ways, you know, I mean, sometimes faith happens right away, sometimes they have to experience it, or it's different. So the other part I want to make, and then I'll be finished. Buddhism recognizes illness as one of the most basic sufferings that human beings experience. From, as we can see from the inclusion in the four sufferings of birth, old age, sickness, and death, in seeking to free people from this suffering, both Buddhism and medicine share a common goal. Buddhism is not simply a kind of spiritual or abstract theory. Instead, through the ages, and, and if you look at Tibetan Buddhism and Thai Buddhism, which is I studied this, I went to Thailand, and I saw on the walls of the temple of Wat Po, they actually had the figures carved in the wall with all the meridians. And then I didn't know what it was, and I asked the monks, what is this? Because I knew what it was. I thought, oh, I know what that is. I know, you know, which, which point that is and all that. They're like, well, this is a school that's very, very old, and this is where the medical schools were. And to this day, it is, was became a medical hospital. So they were looking at science from a different perspective, you know the Chinese took a different point at points to look at science. They were looking at it. So they have a long tradition of having 
Buddhism and men, especially the country of my town, which is so deep in Buddhism, they're very, very there's different sets. There's a way of life there. They're, they're kind, they believe in deep compassion, and there's a lot of uh, medical uh, stores that they have there. So Buddhism has focused really on the reality of physical and mental illness, sought to relieve the suffering of illness from the dual perspective of Buddhism and medicine. And I'm going to stop there. All I have to say is that, personally, I am a big proponent of complementary medicine, not alternative, because the, the government really realized that they needed to study Reiki. There are 144 studies on the, the efficacy of Reiki, energy medicine. And the National Center for Complementary Medicine has many, many studies looking at how the mind, the whole mind-body uh, connection works. And they're realizing so many people are using it that we need to go study so that we can look at the clinical to give it the scientific basis. And so they've become the Reiki and yoga and some of the other what we call now complementary medicine practices. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Beverly, and we bow to your Buddha nature. <laughs> I love that. And I love the talk about the mind-body connection and Norman Cousins. I've actually done a little study of Norman Cousins and the laughter medicine as well. So many wonderful things that you brought up for us to, to contemplate and to ponder. So thank you so very much. Our last speaker today is United Methodist Jennifer Curnan. I said it right. I think that deserves a little like, yay! <laughs> Spiritual director who, I still didn't say it right, who prays with people for healing of the body, mind, and soul. And I took a few other notes. She meets with people one-on-one -on -one and with small groups, and she also offers retreats to help others practice the presence of God and really get in tune with, the, with that presence. So please help me welcome Jennifer. Good afternoon. I'm blessed to be here. I was so interested to hear what the, the panelists would have to say. It's been very enlightening for me, so thank you. And I'd like to start with a prayer, if that's okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity of such a rich group of people to come together in unity. I pray that you open our hearts, our minds, and our souls to what you would have us hear and receive. Give me your words. In the name and nature of God, I pray, which is love. Amen. Thank you. There are so many things that we cannot see in the world. I was listening to Dr. Jasser, and um, I often partner with the medical community and pray with people. But um, just recently, or up until um, quantum physics, we always talked about the fact that there were four dimensions. Um, one time dimension and four spatial dimensions. Quantum physics now shows us that there's 11 dimensions, but we can hardly study them because they are so small. My point being here is there's so many things that we can't see, we can't feel, and our human nature often tells us to dismiss it. Um, I'm going to ask that we have open hearts and minds. I was called to healing ministry approximately seven years ago. It was not my choice. Um, gifts of healing and knowing revealed themselves. It was extremely frightening for me. Uh, my pastor at the time, Dr. Kelly Minner, helped me live and lean into the gifts and is still doing so to this day. Um, it's biblical for the Christian. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 would tell us that um, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And that the Spirit gives them to each one just as it determines. 
So in Christianity, we believe that we um, are given spiritual gifts by the Holy Spirit. I pray for scores of people. I journeyed with many, many people. They are led to me uh, by word of mouth. I pray in hospitals. I'm invited into people's homes. I pray at church. I believe that God's will for us is wholeness, body, mind, and soul. I also believe that they can't be separated. I believe, um, just as you had said, that we are all connected. We are one beating pulse. And that um, sometimes God heals in different ways, often using the medical community. Um, so many, such a myriad of ways that God heals. Um, sometimes it's physical. I do find when I journey with someone that just has a physical issue, often there's an immediate healing, um, which you might say would, you would probably call miraculous. I find just being physically ill is very rare. Usually there's emotional components to it, harbor resentments, forgiveness issues, it's communal, could be environment, and then also um, always spiritual. Whether they know it or not, and it doesn't really matter if they know it because God meets you where you're at. I want to give um, just a couple of quick examples. Um, there was a woman named Iris at the, um, my church, Paradise Valley United Methodist Church. She was in her 80s. Her granddaughter called me one day and told me that her grandmother, Iris, had been diagnosed with cancer and that she would like to come to the 11 o'clock service to the healing prayer team and have us pray for her the next day. That night I was in prayer um, regarding Iris because often when I pray God lifts up um, what needs to be healed. And in this particular case I heard the words, ask Iris. So I called um, my pastor, Dr. Kelly Minder, and I said I'm praying around Iris and I heard ask Iris. So he said okay. The next day, she came to the healing prayer rail with her family. They kneel and we just pray with them. And um, Pastor Kelly said, Iris, what would you have us pray for? Now, I'm going to have to backtrack right now because I'm going to tell you I'm thinking peace, comfort, right? But Iris blurts out healing, of course, which makes me chuckle to this day because, of course, healing, even in your mid-80s, right? So we pray healing. Um, I'd say within a week or two, Pastor Kelly received a call from her son-in-law um, who said that Iris went in for more tests and that they could not find the cancer. That is an example of a physical healing. I think of another woman that I journeyed with, with Pastor Kelly for about two years. Her name was Nancy. She, um, when she came on my path, she had been diagnosed with cancer for about eight years. And at this point, it was throughout her entire body. Uh, her spine was beginning to give way. Uh, she was um, angry. And um, she was a surgeon at Mayo, so very determined. She had been on over the eight years approximately 27 cl clinical trials for chemo. And they uh, had told her that it was time that she get off of the trial. Pastor Kelly and I began a journey with her, and we met with her every week um, for two years, sometimes more than once a week if there was a critical incident. But what I'm here to tell you is there were three types of healings that happened. The first, and there were a number of these, um, I'll give you an example of physical healing. There was a point where her left lung collapsed, her right lung was filled with tumors, to the point that the doctors would tell us that all that was left was a pocket of air the size of a chewing gum stick. She was put on oxygen and they gave her two weeks to live. Um, she prayed, we prayed, um, we have, had a group of women that I have surround her that prayed, 
And I'm going to tell you that over the next month to two months, she was taken off the oxygen. Uh, the left lung had resurrected itself. The right lung, um, the, the cancer cells were dead. She lived on. So there's an example. She had physical healing. She had quite a few like that, one around the paralysis. The next healing that I would suggest or say that she um, experienced was emotional healing. As we journeyed with her, it was very apparent that she had a lot of anger. She harbored a lot of resentments. Pastor Kelly counseled with her and her mother. They had a broken relationship. Um, over time, we saw that relationship heal and become loving and real for the first time in her entire life. She was uh, what she, she would tell you, she was a throwaway child. She was left on the doorstep of an orphanage in China when she was a baby. And she carried a lot of that with her. So there was a lot of emotional work that had to be done. And what I'm going to tell you, what I saw happen was I saw a heart of stone become a heart of flesh. I saw someone that didn't give the sunrise a second chance, start to weep over the beauty of a sunrise. I saw relationships healed. I saw her hold her little girl close and love her husband more than she ever had. I saw her give thanks that she could walk up the street with the cane because they told her she would never walk. She gave thanks for her breath. And so, spiritual healing. Again, body, mind, and soul. She passed after two years, but in a completely different place. I do believe that it's God's will that we live our full life here on earth, 80, 100 years. But I will say I do believe that the ultimate healing is of the soul. I believe that this presence of light and love that we call God is at work in the world today. And he works through all the religions. And he works through doctors. And he works through regular people just like me and you. Um, it's full of mystery and grace. And uh, I'm just grateful to be part of it. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for those wonderful testimonials of healing and not only healing of physical ailments, but also healing of emotional, uh, mental, and spiritual. Oh, okay. thank you, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting for her. Oh, so um, I also really loved the story you shared about the doctor who was abandoned. Um, and because a lot of these can be traced back to abandonment, I, I feel. And you said one thing which I disagree with. Everyone's like, oh my gosh. And that was, you said just regular people. There's no one regular. <laughs> We're all powerful expressions. <laughs> so I want to just affirm uh, that for each and every one of us here today. And now it is your turn. Your turn to ask questions of any of our panelists today. And remembering that we've come here to join in harmony, to join in understanding. So the only housekeeping rule, if you will, is to ensure that those questions are respectful. And so who, would, who has some questions or a question to ask of any of our panelists? Yes. Yes, I have a question to the doctor. Um, and, and I heard about all these studies that show the effect of stress on illness heart disease, blood pressure, and so on, and the effect of things that relieve stress to bring down blood pressure and improve health and so on, is it simply likely that prayer, for people who believe, prayer simply relieves stress and therefore has a positive effect on, on, on healing and health, um, even knowing that many, many people out there praying for you can give believers uh, 
stress. So, uh, for example, um, there's some indication in states where it's legal to get prescription medication uh, if you're terminally ill. Uh, Portland, like Oregon and Washington get prescription medication. There's some indication that people who get that prescription live longer. Um, again, this relief from stress. And so I wonder, is it, is it simply possible that that's what this prayer issue uh, affects? Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, let me answer first before I get to the medical answer. As, as, a, as a spiritual person, um, you know, God is, plays a central role in my life. And, and I think at the end of the day, trying to understand and explain things in my life, I, I try not to do that through my relationship with God because once I take and make it, I know there's a huge industry out there about people who, you know, are near death and have experiences and come back and, and um, report about these things. And I know, and, and uh, I'm not trying to take away the, the facts of, of anecdotes that may exist out there, but I still think at the end of the day, you can have a very strong relationship with God. One of the things I was going to say is that I think we have to be careful not to say that if somebody is very reliant on science, that then their, their faith must be weak, or that they must not be as close to God. That I do think that if you're very pragmatic in the way you approach your life, uh, and yet your relationship with God is very strong, that you simply have a much more fatalistic reliance upon science. Um, and, and having said that, I will tell you that there's a lot of truth in what you're saying scientifically. And that truth comes not from the stress studies. We've been unable to show um, the correlation, even though we believe there's a correlation between stress and heart attacks, stress and stroke. Um, there is a correlation between stress and high blood pressure, and high blood pressure and stroke, and high blood pressure and heart attack. But just because A equals B and B equals C doesn't mean that A equals C. We've been unable to directly correlate stress, even when they yet. study yet. yet. I will tell you the proof of what you're saying that stress is related is all the studies on exercise. Exercise, for example, physically show that patients that exercise have lower blood pressure, better weight, and better health. And as a result, I think exercise, obviously, because of the release of stress during exercise, it makes your body much more healthy. And I think the entire body is one unit. I'm talking about prayer yeah. as a relief from stress. Absolutely. And I think there's obviously... A, a, a mental component to the the impact upon your body which that uh, prayer has either biochemically, physiologically, or something which then releases that stress. And, and again, I'll use one other example. If you look at the Hemlock Society and some of these other organizations that are looking at the uh, end of life uh, trying to hasten death, I will tell you that the, you know, as much as I've spoken quite a bit against those movements because I think it violates our Hippocratic oath and that we play God in hastening death and not allowing natural death. I think those movements have have a have had a reception in a population that has seen my profession fail in our treatment of depression, our treatment of stress, and our treatment of end of life pain and discomfort. So when patients aren't able to get their pain and discomfort treated appropriately, they turn to mechanisms that are easier to end their pain and suffering, which is death and dying. And we, and well. we do need to go on to um, see. Thank you so much for your questions, and we do need to see if anyone else has other questions in respect of others. Thank you so much. I want to thank you all. This is very, very enlightening. I am a member of the Baha'i Faith here in Phoenix, and if I am allowed, I'd like to share a short prayer. Thy name is my healing, O oh my God. My remembrance of thee is my remedy. Nearness to thee is my hope. And love for thee is my companion. Thy mercy to thee is my healing and my succor in both this world and in the world to come. Thou where we are, the all bountiful, the all knowing, the all wise. Thank you. Thank you. Would you see it as something superfluous and not needed, or is it maybe something just scientific that would be beneficial, or would you look at it maybe as a gift that's 
God given us through nature to help us to stay healthy. Thank you. Who'd like to begin? In, in our Buddhist practice, um, we're very respectful of people's ability to make their own decisions when it comes to certain types of medical interventions or practices. So we don't have dictums in terms of an overall support or not support or a particular type of um, subject or intervention like immunization. What we do encourage if a person, you know, we have we have an organization, so like I'm a counselor, if somebody comes to me and they want guidance and they ask me that question, I would tell them, please share to get the wisdom to make the decision that is right for you so that they can, you know, kind of exercise their, their, their own instincts. And then, and then if, they, if they're really confused, then, you know, we do encourage you to go get advice from a medical professional, do some reading, educate yourself as I'm an educator, and then make a decision. But we would never enter into superimpose our um, belief system or what we personally believe. My answer would be sim similar. Uh, I would never uh, suggest to someone whether or not they were to have immunizations for themselves or for their children. But I would suggest that they talk to um, someone from the medical community, that they pray about it, that they do research. And I ultimately think that that is their own personal decision. I believe as a, as a church, we, we would let someone make their own decision on where they were led. And I, I would leave it up to the person. I have to concur with the other um, answers already given as well. It's a very uh, personal and individual decision. And um, our church doesn't dictate any regulations on that or for the taking of any medication, actually. It's an individual decision always. So um, there are um, Christian scientists who do not do immunizations because we truly see man as a spiritual idea and if you're going to immunize then you're kind of moving more into the thought that man is material. But there are also many Christian scientists who feel they want immunization. So it's, it's very much a personal and individual decision. Um, I would say from the immunization perspective, uh, from my faith perspective, is you don't want to input any medication or treatment that causes more harm than good. So if the studies show that the benefit of immunization far exceeds the harm, then I believe it's something that God would want us to do, no different than you know, the religious disagreements on organ transplants and, and other things. Uh, every decision of whether to treat or not to treat uh, should rely on uh, whether the benefit outweighs the harm. Uh, and you know, I know there's some disagreement about whether immunizations are connected to autism, and there's a lot of other other things related to it. Um, and again, we're not going to solve these problems here, other than to say that my sense is the preponderance of the evidence is that immunizations are good for a population. And actually, the way they work, you don't need 100% of the population immunized. It works through herd immunity. So as long as you're starting at 70, 80, 90% of the population immunized, typically it works. Uh, and I would hope that our society never imposes immunizations on anybody. Yes, uh, David, you're well, the Christian Science practitioner in particular. You mentioned Genesis chapter 1 in your presentation. Yes. And uh, I understand the spiritual aspect that you talked about. But what is uh, Genesis 1.29 in your, in your faith fully? I assume you know what that is. If you don't know that. I probably do, but I may have to look it up in my Bible. If you don't mind, are you quoted to me? Genesis one twenty nine. Says that God intended us to eat plants and plants, seed bearing plants as humans. So, are you asking me how I feel about vegetarianism? I'm just asking how does that passage that 
which you quoted Genesis 1, fit into your belief systems? <laughs> Excuse me, I just want to be sure to read the passage so I know what you're referring to. In glass of behold, I have given you every herb there I see in every tree in which and you shall be for let's, me. Let's read it out. Go ahead. Uh, yes, and God ahead. said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of the tree, yielding seed to it, shall be for meat. Zuni is asking me, sir, if your question is, do you feel that, that there's some sort of a conflict between that and, and using or not using medication regularly? No, no. Okay. I, I guess I, I don't, I'm not sure what your question is. We, we eat normally like other people do, so go ahead, explain. Okay. I understood the basis for your yes. faith was based on the Bible. Yes. That's original design, the way I read Genesis 1. Yes. The original design for humans was to be plant eaters. And we're largely no longer doing that. You know, our church really doesn't have a position on that at all. Um, we have um, vegetarians, we have vegans, we have omnivores. Um, I. We are, at this point of our experience, uh, in the human experience, for human beings, and we eat as is normal for human beings, so I, 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 I don't know really what else to say than that. Thank you for your presentation, so it was very enlightening. You know, I, I moved back to this country after being way 20 years in, in, in Europe, and I was uh, assaulted, it seems, by, by ads for medical, uh, for drugs and things like that, it just seems like you have a minute. And I thought, you know, since your presentation is on spirituality, which is so needed today, that there seems to be a resistance, in my mind, to that sense of, of the spiritual nature that we can and should have in our lives. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could, you know, have ads, you know, on TV or in life that would also be promoting this? I mean, why this resistance to the spiritual? I think that's a great, that's a great question. Is, is I think one of the problems, and uh, I see this in many things even outside of medicine, is the hyper-secularization of society. And the hyper-secularization implies that, uh, on the one hand, we, we try to um, pigeonhole groups that may be active politically because of religious issues. And what that does is then prevent, I mean, one of the biggest challenges I have in teaching medical ethics is to try to um, try to enable physicians to become more comfortable in speaking with their patients about faith, mm -hmm. about telling them that, you know, we teach in, in medical ethics that there's morals, values, and ethics. Ethics is sort of professional standards of right and wrong, and that we deal with values is more societal-based, community or family-based, and morals are what we get from faith. Very few physicians and studies have shown that they have comfort in talking about these things, and it's because society in general from the media has become very uh, resistant to enabling. I know a surgeon who prays with his patients before before his uh, operations, and I have a number of patients that come back and say, you know, that was odd, and, and it's just it's a cultural thing that we've become hyper secularized and sort of pigeonhole those people that are publicly faithful and spiritual into one sort of lobby, if you will, in society. When in fact it should be, I think, across the gamut. I concur. I, 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 I just say, um, um, I've spent a lot of years in healthcare, like 25 years working for the VA, so I've seen a lot. And um, one of the issues that comes up, because when you're in the administration and you've got bureaucracy and laws, and that's a quality management, and you know, look at the work positions did, how they did it. And, and, and when you had it, there was a case. Surgeon. And 
and he prayed five times a day. And I understood that. Um, and he scheduled the surgery, and he wanted to pray for the Lord. And he ran into a lot of problems between the regulations of the institution versus his needs to uh, satisfy the needs of his faith. And so I think you find that there's this conflict between regulation and position in terms of what you can and can't do in a particular setting. Um, that, that really, I think, um, creates a division, even if we did have groups who, you know, basically the chaplain service takes care of the needs of the patients. But the individual uh, practitioner who has deep faith or deep belief, and, and in, in some ancient practices, it was including in the medical um, attention to patients that it was part of the training. And so that has slowly seeped out of the regular, even in the uh, medical education system. So um, well, I think that I totally agree that the consequences sometimes doesn't match you know, the action as it comes through. And that, that's a big problem. I find that um, speaking from an individual level, people that come across my path often come as a last resort. And it's because we are a highly secularized society. And um, it doesn't matter that they come that way, but it's um, why not try God? So I think that um, we have a society that puts emphasis more on what we can see and touch. Sometimes it takes us into our own crisis before we actually are opened to, hey, I'll try even God. And I think that's, um, that's what we experience. Another question? I, I'd like to address the subject of vegetarianism versus carnivore, which I am carnivore. I respect and honor anybody's choice to be vegetarian. But I think it is for those of us who do still eat meat occasionally, it's all God. And as a Hindu friend of mine recently said to me, it is not fair for all of you people to become suddenly vegetarian because you're putting an impact on us who are brought up generation after generation of being vegetarian. Now, if it's all God and it's all good, and we have free will, and we have body, different body types, then we have to honor and respect everybody's choice. And so I once tried to force myself to become a vegetarian, and I got into a lot of serious trouble. Until my physician said to me, you do not have an Eastern body, you have a Western body. And your body requires some animal protein. You don't have to eat it every day, but you should have some at least two or three times a week. So if you have some things of not being vegetarian, you know that it's all good, because it's all God. Thanks, Mary. Um, I wanted to really quickly, before we go to that, add something to your comment, if I will. Because um, I'm actually, uh, wasn't on the panel today, I was a moderator, but I am a pastoral care minister at a local church as well. And one of the things that I often get asked is, when people are going in for surgery, to pray with them and to pray with their doctors. And the doctors, I'd say, I've never had a doctor refuse to have that prayer. They're open, they're receptive. We pray in the, often in the room, right before the pre-op room, and, um, and they're, they're like, thank you, I've got the, I've got the tailwind now under, under my, uh, my things, and they come out, and sometimes when we're doing one surgery recently, well, we weren't, but there was a surgery performed for our um, senior minister's husband, and um, the doctor actually came out at one point and said, we need a little bit more tailwind there. So we all got busy praying for it, and I have to say that he had major heart surgery and is recovering beautifully, and had a few nicks and bumps along the way with that surgery, but it is magnificent when the doctors 
recognize the power as Zudi does, and we can work in harmony. So I just wanted to add that. I'm a hospital chaplain. Yeah, Paul. You're speaking to the choir. Yeah. I'd like to ask the panel something. How do you propose to enable all of us to include spirituality in healthcare? And I need to make a disclaimer. Zudi is my doctor, and so oh. I'm amazing. And he does prayer. And uh, so it works. We're in a holistic healthcare paradigm. But we have those that resist it. And I'll give you one example. I had one doctor that told me one day, he says, I look forward when all the chaplains are gone and all the social workers are gone so we can do our work and then come back. And so, in that, we need to empower people to ask. And we do everything in our power, right, Judy and panel, to make sure that health care includes spirituality. And so all you have to do, as Bitsy said, is ask. I have doctors that have come in, nurses that have come in before surgery, and said, please pray. We need help. And so uh, thank you for the time. And so to the panel, how do you empower us? Would you like to start? I'll start. I think that's a great question. And I think it's, um, it's really wonderful that um, as much sense of prayer and spirituality that we can get into all um, phases of life is, is wonderful. In my own experience, I um, had uh, six babies. Most of them were born at home with a midwife. However, I did have twins, also delivered by a midwife. Uh, but uh, the state law was that that happened in a hospital. So. Um, so I have interfaced in my own life primarily with the um, obstetrical folks. And I have found that the best way is to just live what you believe. If you believe that God is love, you are loving. And you love every professional that's helping you. You love the people around you. You are just um, really living love and a sense of respect for everybody's point of view and what everybody can bring to the table. Um, in my own experience, in Christian Science, we have what are called Christian Science Nurses. And um, Christian Science Nurses are like any other nurse, except they do not administer medication. But if you need bandaging or assistance or bed care or whatever, then, then we have nurses for that. So when I went into the hospital to uh, deliver my twins, I brought a Christian science nurse with me. And she was very well received um, by everybody there. She was with me the whole time. Um, if there was a little snag that came up, and we actually had a big snag with one of the babies that was beautifully met through Christian science. Um, but every time there was a need for prayer, that she would quietly slip out of the room call the Christian Science practitioner, and that need was immediately met. And uh, when one of the babies was born, well, let me, I won't, won't talk too long, but just a couple very interesting things. The physician right before the birth was insistent on an x-ray, which I didn't want to have. But when you're in labor with twins, you don't argue with your physician. <laughs> so <clears throat> I agreed, and the x-ray was done, and it came out totally blank. There was no explanation the picture didn't take. And I could hear the doctor reading out the poor tech in the hall, but they didn't do it again. And then uh, and both of these babies were delivered perfectly normally, head down, they were 40 weeks, six and eight pounds. Um, but there was a concern with one of the babies, the pediatrician on the call was called in, and she was concerned about something about there needed to be a blood transfusion. Again, we talked to the practitioner, and that was that as well. So, short, long story short, just I think if we just live our love, that's that that helps everybody know what to do. Thank you, uh, Paul, for that uh, question. Uh, I think it's really important. And uh, by the way, and, uh, I don't mean to. Uh, I'll be running off right after this. Uh, um, and please say prayers for people in Syria. We just heard that uh, there were a couple weapons used this morning. Uh, Um, I do want to tell you about where medicine is heading quickly. 
Um, the hospital paradigm is shifting to the community. It's called accountability care organizations that you see as part of uh, Obamacare and the uh, PPAC or the, uh, um, um, the new uh, legislation on health care. So the entire concept of what used to be hospital medicine is shifting into the community. The government reimbursement for health care will be tied to patient lives so that hospitals will be disincentivized from readmissions and rather they'll be doing more community health models. So I tell you all of that because it's completely relevant to what Paul is mentioning is that you know the, the attachment of chaplains to the hospital, just like now in the ethics committee, we're helping evolve the ethics committee now for, I'm helping with banner in a community sense uh, and to have ethics uh, available, uh, consultations available for outpatients because increasingly there's going to be conflicts on what will be provided or will not be provided and value conflicts will be increasing more and more. And I think one of the things you can do if you look economically in the GDP, about 18% of our GDP now is healthcare. And if you look at the, the top employers in Arizona, uh, and the top uh, five are a number of uh, healthcare organizations, you can, uh, we need to have a cultural shift within those organizations. And you can do that. I don't think the problem's coming from the providers or necessarily from nurses or any of that. If there is an issue, and I do believe, even though they have spiritual care at the hospitals, I do believe the corporate side of medicine yes. does not does not necessarily endorse or push spiritual care to the level at which it should be. Now that's my own editorializing, but I do believe that it's sort of a checkbox they put. They they respond too much to the cultural pressures from Wall Street or wherever that say that we need to be more secular. You'll even find that in their literature that they put out, etc. And if they do start leaning more towards spiritual, they'll start hearing it from some of the, the, the less religious components that are more, that have stronger lobbies when it comes to the economics of medicine. So it needs a cultural shift to do that. And right now, with medicine shifting out of the hospital into the community sense, it's important to set things in place now, uh, just like we're setting, you know, and Banner's been listening and working very well with our group to do things here that's not happening across the country. There aren't that many ECOs that are generate, that are developing ethics committees. And I think similarly, the spiritual care paradigm needs to become part of the community from a healthcare perspective. Um, you know, it is time for us to wrap up. Before Dr. Cash goes, I need to just uh, yeah. say one thing. Sure. Uh, I'm sure you know that uh, Dr. Chasser, uh, you see him on the news all the time. CNN or Fox or whoever it is, he's speaking to the Senate in the nation or in the House of Representatives. Dr. Jasser has been on the board of the Arizona Innovation Group for 12 years, 12 yeah. years. And sometime within the first year or two, I was called on to put together a brief history of all religions. So I sent out the thing to Buddhists, the Hindus, etc., and said, How old is your religion? Is the history? Uh, how many? people in your faith, in the world, in the nation, in the state, and then what are five primary issues that you teach in your religion? Dr. Sudi, I don't remember this decision, but I have a paper in my file, I saw just the other day. I'm laminated <laughs> uh, summary. How, uh, how old is religion? Dr. Gasser responded, how old is God? <laughs> I've been asking that question for since I was four years old. The next question was, how many Muslims in the world, in the nation, in the state, in the valley, how many in the world? A lot. <laughs> how many in the U.S.? Less. <laughs> how many in Arizona? Less. <laughs> how many in the valley? Less. Okay, then what are five of the primary teachings of your religion? Number one, be good. Number two, be very good. Number three, be very, very good. Number four, be very, very, very good. Number five, if you can't be good, feel guilty. Ah. Okay.
assistants. Courtney is a member of our board of directors, and her three children have come here a couple of times and been to our board meetings several times, and they are the most beautiful, most well-behaved, most wonderful yeah. kids in the world. Yeah. I want to thank Now, just let me say, let's give a deep word of thanks to the panel for this. And then, up here on the, uh, the table, we have several things uh, pertaining to the, uh, the Arizona Interfaith Movement. We have calendars, an annual calendar, which uh, has underneath each month in red letters the holy days of every faith. Buddhist, Hindu, Sikh, Baha'i.